Okay. Good day, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. My name is Tony Sadat, and I am the CEO with Sutron Global and your host today. Many of you have checked out our website when you registered for this webinar, so you know a little bit about Sutron already. In few words, Sutron Global has been providing knowledge services solutions to special libraries for decades. We're honored to have sponsored today's session, but this is not about Sutron Global. This is about a special guest, Guy Sinclair, a dear friend, a great advisor, whose name, face, voice, and his outstanding work in knowledge services is familiar to all of us. Guy is the president of SMR International Management Consulting Practice in New York. He's also lecturer in knowledge services at Columbia University in the city of New York. <clears throat> sometimes, thought of a knowledge, sometimes he's thought of as knowledge services evangelist, outstanding author. His latest book just published recently. The title is Knowledge Services, a Strategic Framework for the 21st Century Organization. And this is why we're all here together and we're going to be talking about that today. Guy, welcome to our program, and thank you so much for ac ac accepting our invitation. Tony, I thank you very much for that gracious introduction, and of course for our long years of friendship, friendship and all the work we've done together. Uh, I'm very, very grateful of you to do this, and I'm very happy to be here today. Welcome to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've prepared a few questions for you today. However, yes. I'm not the only one who's going to ask questions. At the end of the program, we'll have an uh, audience to submit their question through the chat box. So those of us that they can remain after the interview, which will approximately maybe about 30 minutes, then we'll be happy to accept your question through the chat box. So let's get started. Uh, I want to basically start with my first question, Guy, and that's on the title of the book. The title of the book is Knowledge Services Strategic Framework for the 21st Century Organization. Let's begin by speaking about the title. Why did you choose this particular title? Well, I think I've got a fairly clear response to that good question, Tony. Um, I have been working with knowledge services for a long time, and uh, uh, my business partner, a man by the name of Dale Stanley, has been working with me for many, many years on this. We actually had our first assignment together in South Africa around 1996, and we've become, of course, close business, professional, and personal friends. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, Dale began to get serious about the fact that there is no uh, single volume or single book about knowledge services, Guy's subject of knowledge services. So his idea was that uh, there should be a, quote, legacy book, unquote, by Guy about this subject. Well, I had to sort of think about that a little bit because it seemed it had some sort of an ageist slant to it. But yes, there, I, I like the idea of doing uh, a, a legacy book. And in fact, as we worked, we talked about it and thought about it, we realized that the main thing about knowledge services is that it does not apply to any one particular industry or line of work or that sort of thing. Now, Dale and I, SMR International, we've done most of our work having to do with research organizations, that sort of thing, uh, specialized libraries, uh, information uh, centers, that sort of thing. But we, we realize, as, our, as we talk about knowledge services, knowledge strategy with our colleagues and our clients, that it really relates to any organization. Doesn't matter whether it's a business or a nonprofit, a not for profit, a charity organization, or even a volunteer organization. And the whole idea of knowledge services doesn't matter about the organization. It's designed to ensure the highest levels of knowledge sharing in those organizations where it's practiced because it does support the knowledge strategy and the work of the knowledge strategist. So 
from my point of view, the book has been designed, and we think we've been successful with this, to provide a professional, practical, and yes, my own personal guidance for the knowledge strategist, the organization's knowledge uh, uh, thought leader. Does that give you an idea of why we decided to use this title? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Actually, this is a great way to segue to my next question, and that is, what is knowledge services? And what makes knowledge services the best solution for managing organizational knowledge? Well, let's take what I had just had to say just now a little bit and build on that just a little bit. And let me get into some, some defining work. Let me get to playing with the definition for knowledge services. Now, the first thing I think about not with knowledge services is it's not necessarily uh, a thing in and of itself. It is more likely an approach or a way of thinking about the management of intellectual capital in any organization. And this approach or this way of thinking about intellectual capital and managing intellectual capital, which we now call managing knowledge, uh, when we do it with knowledge services, we converge information management, including technology management, knowledge management, and strategic learning. We converge them all into one enterprise-wide discipline. And as I said, that purpose is very clear. We want to make sure that the organization is sharing knowledge at the highest levels. So one of the things that we try to do is to figure out how we can define it in ways that everybody in the organization can understand what we're doing. So I have a few, I have a graph that I like to use. I, 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 uh, 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 a, a, a visual that I think sort of helps us to explain what we think of knowledge services, how we, how we define it. First of all, you see those three elements that I've identified as what we converge, what we bring together in the organization in support of a strategy for managing knowledge, managing intellectual capital in the organization. Information management, knowledge management, strategic learning, they all come together. And it's very important that we understand that they all come, to get, come together because through merging these three elements I've, I've identified, we have these results, this product that we're going to have in the organization. I like to think about it as uh, sort of the, the four basics of what you get when you have, a, have knowledge services practiced in your organization. First of all, it's, there is strength and research, research in every organization, and we all do it. It doesn't matter whether you're keeping files on, on, uh, in, in human capital environment or keeping financial files or product development files, doesn't matter, you're keeping records, and then you have to research them, also external research. So we strengthen research through knowledge services. We also deal a lot with decision making, but with knowledge services, we're doing it in context. We're thinking about the decisions going to be made in this specific uh, situation. Innovation, sometimes I get a little criticized when I say this because there are those who do say that innovation in itself, in and of itself, by definition, is accelerated. No, it isn't. It really isn't. Many organizations think of themselves as being innovative, but then they'll start a project, start an idea, and it will go on and on and on. So what we have with knowledge services, because we're sharing knowledge and information and strategic learning, we are moving it forward. We're taking it forward at a faster rate. And then fa the, the last of these results that I have to give attention to, now many people might think, oh, this is about libraries, or this is about research centers, and that sort of thing. No, it's not necessarily necessarily true because a knowledge asset, of course it can be artifacts, it can be books, it can be journals, it can be databases, it can be things. Of course, those are all knowledge assets. They're assets because we go to them to find to, to, to uh, 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 find the knowledge or the information we're looking for. But at the same time, we have to recognize that the people with whom we work are also knowledge assets. And what we do with knowledge services, because it's all about knowledge sharing, is that we work with those human knowledge assets, which we'll talk about a little bit as we move forward. But an interesting piece of this is that in pulling this all together, over the years we've come up with what I think are, of are the fundamental or the basic elements of knowledge services. Now my students like to tease me. Uh, when, I, and when I'm teaching this and using this slide, uh, they like to say, well, wait a minute, 
what you're talking about here is this is all these four things that's all knowledge services is if you're doing these four things if your planning is interactive throughout the organization if your partnerships are not just amongst your own network but among other networks as well if your communications are not just in your department but in other departments or in other offices in in other locations makes a lot of sense and then the whole business of shared learning and training if we put together a strategic learning activity that works for the people in the uh, 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 in the product development area uh, cannot some of those attributes or some of those characteristics of that uh, learning activity be moved over into something that's going on for human capital or for economic uh, development that sort of thing so we pull it all together it's all about are working together and that leads us to what I think of as the three primary attributes the three primary characteristics of knowledge services yes we all know about transparency and unless there's a security situation or something like that uh, then we, we, we want our organizations to deal with information and knowledge in a transparent way collaboration it goes without saying we all believe very strongly in collaboration and we try to do it the new one for us nowadays is giving attention to the whole idea of collegiality we want to be collegial with the people we're working with with the people we're sharing knowledge with so we don't have people who close their office doors lock the doors and don't want to work with us they are people who they're interested in what we're doing we're interested in what they're doing and it becomes a whole idea of how we work together uh, in, in knowledge sharing for the benefit of the larger organization. Is it falling into place, Tony? Does this, does this definition now begin to make some sense? It's definitely getting there. We're on the right track here, Guy. You know, actually, like it, it's interesting that the, the audience, as well as myself, for decades we've been hearing about knowledge management, KM. Yes. Why knowledge services and not knowledge management? Okay, I'm going to try to be brief. And I will tell you in the first chapter of the book, it's not so brief because I get into this whole background thing because there's a lot that goes on in knowledge management and knowledge management works very well in those organizations that have been successful with it. However, for the first part of our history of knowledge management intellectual capital, going back about 20, 25 years, maybe 30 years, uh, we had a kind of a situation as a problem because business leaders, enterprise managers, their focus is on resources, on financial revenue, how much things cost, how much, how, how, how much money we're losing or making because we're doing this. They want to know what the tangible results are of an activity. Well, guess what? You go to someone of, of, of that ilk and you start talking about knowledge management is good for your organization. They look at you, or they used to. They don't do it so much anymore. They look at you and they say, well, what do you mean? You can't manage knowledge. You can talk about knowledge, and in fact, uh, there are people who say that uh, 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 knowledge management is basically working with knowledge, but what are the tangible results? So we went through a period of that time there where, uh, and I don't mean to be ageist about this, but there were people of a certain generation who were trained in certain MBA or enterprise management programs and they just couldn't understand why something as vague and as amorphous as knowledge we talk about managing it well then once we start talking about what intellectual capital is what the people in the organization know or conversely what they don't know and we have to work on uh, then it begins to make sense to them and then one day it just came to Mr. Guy and there may have been other people who did work in this area but I've not found reference to them it came to me that what enterprise leaders what executives are dealing with is what they can put a figure on and so what is that well in every organization it's services there's financial services there is there are their catering services anything that has the word services attached to it you can sort of these executives can sort of figure out that they're paying for that they're renting it or they're outsourcing or whatever but there there, there, there is some some resource exchange taking place there and I thought 
well, why don't we do that with knowledge, with intellectual capital? Let's talk about how it can be quantified, how we can, can value it, evaluate it and value it for the larger organization. So that's why, Tony, I sort of focus, not sort of, that's why I focus on knowledge services. When I'm working with clients, when I'm working, and I have many clients who talk about knowledge management all the time, but they bring our company in to talk with them and their staff about how knowledge management might be refined into or or worked into the whole knowledge services approach because they understand it's tangible and it supports knowledge strategy for the larger organization. Does this work? Is it coming through? Absolutely. absolutely. You're gonna let me know. You're gonna let me know if I do it wrong, aren't you? Okay. <laughs> Definitely do that. You know, uh, that brings me to my next question, which is: Can you use knowledge services with all knowledge work, including? archives, library services, or any other research or knowledge sharing activity in the organization? Absolutely. That's why Guy wrote the book. Because, and that's why I talk about it. It's not just a business book. It's not just a library science book. It's not just information science. It is for any organization because, and when you look at some of the more specific ones like that, archives, records management, enterprise content management, all those things. We're working with this, this information knowledge, strategic learning that needs to be shared. And what we're trying to do is to come up with some sort of strategy for how in the whole organization, whether it's an archives department or the archives department of a historical society or the archives department of a great international development organization. I mean, these people have to collect the, the materials that they've used in some activities so that they can go back to them. They're not, what's that old cliche? They're not reinventing the wheel. They're, they're, they're moving forward. They're starting with what, know, what happened the last time they did a project like this and they can build on that. Now, the way we get to that is we take this person who uses knowledge services to support knowledge strategy and that person, whom I call the knowledge strategist for the organization, and it's it's a pretty important uh, job in those organizations that 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 move in this direction. In fact, I have this fantasy, I have my ideal that we'll soon have our organizations, no matter how big or how small. In addition to having a chief executive officer, a chief finance officer, they will have a chief knowledge strategy officer, someone who is responsible for this. But until we get there, I'm satisfied to talk about the work of the knowledge strategist and look at what this person does. This person understands and analyzes what's going on in the company, whether the whole, whether the whole company or just some small part of it or other part of it, the knowledge environment that's that's in place there. And most of the time this is done what we, through what we call the knowledge services audit. It simply means that the knowledge strategist and his or her team go out and asks questions and comes up with findings, results from the, these questions being asked, and then comes up with some sort of recommendations. Oftentimes they're just preliminary recommendations, but comes up with recommendations how the organization can move into a better direction in terms of knowledge sharing and knowledge strategy for the larger organization, leading to what I say in this last uh, uh, line, leading to the implementation of knowledge-related strategic recommendations which will bring us to a knowledge culture for the larger organization. I talk about my fantasies. I do think that uh, the organization that's going to succeed and see it succeed best is going to be thinking of itself as a knowledge culture. And it's the knowledge strategist who works with that, who puts that all together. We go back to my friend, my, my colleague and friend Dale, who talks about how uh, what we do with knowledge services is we put KM to work. It's the practical side of KM. And what we do with the knowledge strategy is we, we, we create a form or a framework, like hence the title of the book. We create a framework for strategy that can be used in the larger organization. Making sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Good. I, like that. I like that idea. You know, by now, you know, listening to you, I'm sure the audience as well as myself, you know, we're just wondering who are the main characters in this book? And what are the real winners in the knowledge services story? Well, 
I think whenever we think about knowledge services and whatever it is we're trying to do, we have to give a little bit of thought to history and what's gone before. Because knowledge services and knowledge strategy and the development of a knowledge culture are all built on management and leadership and we have to go back to the history of management and leadership and see how they all fit together. So I've had some people who have influenced me throughout my life, my professional life as well as my personal life, and I bring them into the picture. And of course I began with Peter Drucker. I mean, he was such a remarkable person. We all know who he was. We, excuse me, we all know what his contribution was. He never knew it. But he was Mr. Guy's primary mentor when I was a young man. He was the person who helped me develop my professional character. Now, he's been gone for many years, and like I say, he never knew he was my mentor, but I read everything about him or by him I could get my hands on. So a lot of this work that comes from, from uh, the work that we do with Knowledge Services, it pulls together the work of the father of modern management, Peter Drucker, was telling us how to manage. Now some people might think that's very old-fashioned. It's not. It's classic. Once we learn it, it's classic to how we do good management and good leadership. And I connect Drucker with a man by the name of David Lilienthal. Back in the, a long time ago at Carnegie University, he gave a series of lectures and they were entitled Management, the Humanist Art. So when you take what Mr. Drucker thought about and what Mr. Lillian thought, thought about, it all has to do with the people. It doesn't so much have to do with the way the organization is achieving its mission. Of course it has its mission, but it recognizes that that mission is achieved only through the support of understanding what the people are doing in the organization. So I work with Drucker, I work with Drucker, I work with Lillian Thal, and my bridge my bridge to what I think of as modern or present day leadership and, and management, but also into the future because I do work with a lot of young people. I'm very caught up with the millennials and what they're contributing to society, to the workplace. And so my bridge between historical management and leadership and what's going on today and what will be taking place in the future is a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, I like to say, by the name of Frances Hesselbein. She was president and CEO of the Girl Scouts of USA for quite a few years, and while she was there, Peter Drucker came in and worked with her because he was beginning to get serious about management and leadership in the nonprofit community. He wanted to see these things, these ideas carry over. So he, when she decided to retire from the Girl Scouts, he came to her and said, well, you're not really going to retire because you're going to be the president and CEO of the Peter F. Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management, which she did for many years. And a few years ago, in her honor, it was renamed. It was renamed the Frances Hesselbein Leadership uh, Institute. And she is a great friend. She's also a great success. Many people think of her as the greatest leader in America. Uh, she was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1998. And I feel honored that I can have conversations with her and be with her. Uh, in fact, I think of her, I hope she won't be embarrassed of my saying this, but I sort of think of her as the dean of American leadership development. It is just so important what she is doing with her work. Then I have a good relationship with my friend Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Haas Edersheim, who not only wrote the definitive Drucker, the biography of uh, the book about Drucker's uh, work, but also the biography of Marvin Bauer, the founder of, of the McKinsey, of McKinsey Company. And she also wrote the foreword to my book. I'm very proud to know her, and I can't think of anybody who is better qualified to write about knowledge services and knowledge strategy than Liz. She's, she just really comes, comes into play for me. Then there is my dear, dear friend, Dr. Lee Eagle at NYU. He teaches in my course, I teach in his course. I don't know of anybody who is more excited about sharing knowledge services and the construct of knowledge services than Lee is. So we have our own little community of, of, of practice. We have our little, little organization, our framework you might say, and we get together with a great many other people 
uh, throughout the course of our professional lives. All of these people are very influential, and we have these lively discussions about what it is that we're trying to do. Because when we think about who the winners are and who's, what the benefits of knowledge services are, we recognize that in any organization, big, small, formal, informal, in any field or line of work or profession, the winners are the people who become comfortable with the organization becoming a knowledge sharing culture. And the organization progresses to succeed as its organizational mission is achieved. Now, to establish these winners, that they keep winning, we spend a lot of time thinking about what counts for them. What characteristics of the workplace are important? Social sustainability, management, leadership, corporate social responsibility, that sort of thing. They're all required and they come in as part of knowledge services and lead to their success. I particularly look to three attributes and three characteristics. These are what people have to have to be successful in knowledge services and as knowledge strategists. Obviously, they're all represented in the people I, who influence me and that I try to influence, but I just want you to know about them and what these are, that what these things are that we think are going on in the or in the larger world, in the workplace, and how we how the our knowledge services work, our knowledge strategy work can be of benefit to them. Does this is this cup falling into place? Yeah, I'm asking yeah. you directly because I don't want to be be confusing anybody. No, 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 absolutely. This is great. In fact, you know, I could be sitting here and asking you a question all day long, but obviously, you know, you do not have the time to do so. So I only got a couple more questions before, you know, we allow audience to submit their question. Uh, what I want to know is that the term knowledge services sounds like more than a management methodology. Is knowledge services some kind of a professional movement relating to management and leadership? and how they connect with knowledge services? Well, this is, this is not new. I have, I have friends and colleagues, and especially my students, who see what I say about the millennials. It, it, it comes up pretty often, and I hadn't thought of much about it for a long or at, at all until fairly recently, and especially my students when I teach in Europe or my students from Europe who come to Columbia to be with us. A movement is nothing more than a, a sort of a coordinated activity between a group of people to gain something, to move forward or to, 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 to uh, uh, make some contribution. And so if it's done with social issues, with art, with all sorts of things, of course, it could be done with with a profession uh, or with with in the workplace with the things that we do. So I guess it can apply to what we're doing. But I was taken recently with the remarks of someone who went a step further. I was I was quite. I'm gonna. I have to read it because I don't want to get it mixed up. I'm so pleased with what she had to say. My friend uh, recently spoke to me about how her thinking about knowledge services has come to include thinking about what society, the bigger society, not what's happening in my workplace, the bigger society can accomplish when people are willing to embrace the goals of knowledge services. She goes on to say that in doing so, these people begin to share thoughts and knowledge with each other, moving toward a situation in which they can unite the various units and sections of society. And when they do that, she feels very strongly they can all work with each other and not against each other to reach some common goals. So if that's possible, yes, I guess we could say that knowledge service is, is something, some sort, or could be leading to some sort of, uh, 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 some sort of uh, um, movement having to do with how we share information, knowledge, and strategic learning. Very good, very good. And one last question for you, Guy, from me. You mentioned that Peter Drucker became known as the father of modern management. And we've heard about Marvin Bauer at McKinsey being known as the father of management consulting. Would you like to be known as the father of knowledge services? Now, what do you think? Of course, that's very gratifying and very flattering to be asked that question. And um, of course, of course, anybody who does any work that's considered sort of of interest, that sort of thing, uh, it's good to move in that direction uh, and to get that recognition. 
but it's not about me. It's not about me at all. It's about the winners I just talked about, and it's about all the many people, not just this now growing every day community of practice that I interact with all the time. We have a wonderful time, and the people I specifically named, students, consulting clients, colleagues we talk about over dinner, just as some of us did last night. Uh, these sorts of things come into play because all of us begin to thinking about it. Yes, I, I, if I'm given some credit, I would be very grateful. But I think it's really us as a society, as a profession, as management, leaders or leading managers, whatever it is we want to, however we want to characterize ourselves, it's something we're all contributing to. And I think that would be, that would work with what Mr. Drucker said because he was very strongly, he believed very strongly that, and I might have mentioned this, we, had, we do our work, we try to meet the mission of the organization, but we also try to contribute to the common good. And I think that's something we can do. So having, having inspired me a little bit with that, uh, 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 Tony, it gives me the opportunity then to come back to you and say thank you very much for what you've done today. Having the opportunity to work with you, Sutron, Sutron Global, all of your team, and to have you be the first organization, business, group to go public with talking about knowledge services, a strategic framework for the 21st century organization. I'm very honored. I'm very flattered. I'm very honored. And I feel very privileged. Thank you, Tony. Our, our pleasure. Just uh, one last note is that what is the best way to get this book? OK. There is an Amazon author's page under my name. Uh, I also know that uh, 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 Baker and Taylor is, is uh, not Baker and Taylor, uh, Barnes and Noble is, is pushing it a little bit. Uh, the, Academic institutions where I have taught or do teach, uh, I understand that their bookstores are going to have at least sample issues there for students and faculty to look at. Uh, by and large, it can be ordered uh, ordered directly. For, uh, any bookseller, can you can talk to them about it. They can get it. And the uh, uh, international distributor that DeGroder uses tell me that they can get the books to the, 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 their customers in a question of just a matter of two or three days. So uh, it's available, so I hope that anybody who wants to read it will, will get a copy and do so. It is also available as an e-book uh, because we're finding that quite a few people do prefer to do their serious reading nowadays in e-books. And so I'm delighted to tell you that it is available that way too. So thank That's you. Great. Well, just to uh, make a note that how passionate I am personally with the topic and Sutron Global is, for the next 12 months, for those people that they subscribe to our products and services, they will receive a complimentary copy of this book. Oh, what an honor. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you. Guy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And at this point of time, we want to move to our second part of our program.